The Quarterly, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Lesson 9, 2nd Corinthians 1 1 to 2 11. Comfort in Affliction. In 2nd Corinthians, Paul's major emphasis is to speak words of comfort and encouragement to his hearers, while also correcting their understanding of what it means to be an apostle and of the nature of the gospel itself. It is a gospel of human weakness presented by apostles who are afflicted and beaten down, just as Christ himself suffered in his earthly body. At the same time, however, it is also a gospel through which indescribable glories are received by God's people. Paul's opponents might present themselves as super apostles, 2 Corinthians 11.5, 12.11, leaping tall buildings in a single bound, a presentation that the Corinthians apparently found compelling. But such a presentation was out of step with the gospel presented in the sufferings, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which is the only true gospel that there is. Paul's goal was to challenge the Corinthians to recognize the true gospel that Paul first preached to them and to return to it, turning their backs on any apostles who would preach a different Jesus or a different gospel. Paul begins 2 Corinthians, as he did 1 Corinthians, by identifying himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to serve in that role. 2 Corinthians 1 1, see 1 Corinthians 1 1. This identification stresses Paul's authority to speak on behalf of God and to require obedience to his teaching, so it's typically used in letters where he's aware that there may be resistance to his directions. In this case, the nature of what it means to be an apostle will be central to Paul's letter. To, re to reject Paul as an apostle because of his weakness is not merely to reject him, but to reject the God who chose him, the God who has a long history of choosing what is weak to shame what is strong. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. The Corinthians are addressed as the Church of God and saints, stressing the fact that God has called them together to serve him through a commitment to holy living, 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Saints, or holy ones, hagioi, is Paul's favorite word to designate believers, used some 43 times in his letters. And it's particularly striking when used of the Corinthians, whose struggles with sin were significant. Their status as holy was not the result of their own personal righteousness, but rather was due to God's gift of righteousness in Jesus Christ. See 1 Corinthians 1 2. The Corinthians were also part of the Church of God, a title that links them with believers in all times and all places, especially in their larger context in the province of Achaia. As such, they were the recipients of grace and peace from God, a blessing that recalls the priestly benediction of Numbers 6, 24-26. Having begun his letter with grace and peace, Paul will close it with a similar pronouncement of peace and grace, in spite of the sometimes stormy contents that lie in between. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 and 13. Normally, at this point in his letter, Paul would give thanks for God's work in the life of the church to which he was writing, as he did in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 through 9. In this case, however, there is no word of thanksgiving, but rather a blessing of the God who comforts us in our afflictions, verse 4. And this introduces the initial topic of the letter, afflictions and comfort writing to a church that was overly enamored with strength and success, see 1 Corinthians 4.8, Paul wanted to focus their attention in a different direction from the outset. As an apostle, it was Paul's calling to be afflicted, sharing abundantly in Christ's sufferings, verse 5. The result of that shared suffering had been to equip Paul to comfort others in their afflictions, out of the comforts he himself had received from God. Verse 4.
Specifically, his own sufferings had helped him to comfort the Corinthians when they endured similar sufferings to those that Paul was experiencing. Verse 6. The point is clear. All Christians must expect to suffer, even apostles. But God uses those sufferings for the building up of his people in the comfort of the gospel. See Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 2. This expectation was not what the Corinthians would have wanted to hear, perhaps. But it's nonetheless central to the gospel. Paul then referred to a specific affliction that he experienced in the Roman province of Asia. Verse 8. He doesn't specify what exactly that affliction was. Perhaps he expected Titus, as the bearer of the letter, to fill in some of the details. But it was severe enough that Paul felt under the sentence of death. Verse 9. The point of mentioning it, however, was not to thrill the Corinthians with news of some narrow escape, but to teach them what God was up to in such circumstances, and to model for them how they should encounter similar challenges in their own lives. Through this life-threatening suffering, Paul had been forced to rely on God as the one who raises the dead, verse 9. It's one thing to confess that truth in the abstract, but something quite different to declare it in the face of your own impending death. But God had delivered Paul from similar trials before, and Paul was confident that he would do so again. In particular, Paul was sure that God would deliver him through the prayers of the churches, and so the Corinthians could be part of the process of deliverance as they joined others in praying for Paul. Verse 11. Paul had been forced by various circumstances to postpone a planned visit to Corinth after his previous letter, which had led to some suspicion of his integrity by the Corinthians, suspicions that were being stoked by his opponents in Corinth. So Paul felt the need to defend his sincerity and his loving feelings toward the Corinthians. His prime motivation was the grace of God, verse 12, which bound him together with the Corinthians, as co-recipients of the gospel. They would be Paul's boast on the last day, and they would also boast of their relationship to him, verse 14. Far from playing games with the Corinthians, he'd been honest and transparent about his weakness and sufferings in Asia, verses 8 through 11. Paul's conscience in the matter was completely clear, verse 12. Though of course, his conscience was not the ultimate witness to the truth. See 1 Corinthians 4, 14. Indeed, Paul had sincerely desired to come to the Corinthians earlier, on his way to Macedonia, verse 16. But he decided that a visit at that time would have been painful for them rather than productive, chapter 2, verse 1. He wanted his visit to them to be an experience of God's grace rather than an act of God's judgment upon them, chapter 1, verse 15. As a result, there was a fundamental consistency between Paul's approach to the Corinthians and God's approach to us in the gospel. God is faithful, and the message about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is a yes to all the promises of God. Chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Paul had confidence that this gospel message of grace was God's fundamental word to the Corinthians, and that God would establish them firmly in Christ anointing their hearts with the Holy Spirit as a seal of their authenticity as Christians, verses 21 to 22. It's this message of good news that he wished to bring to them when he came to visit, not a threatening word of the danger of their being counterfeits, who ran the risk of hearing the Father's no on the last day. See Matthew 25, verses 32 to 46. This was why he had written difficult truths that caused him as much pain as them. It was only in order to express his abundant love for them. Chapter 2, verse 4. Now someone in the Corinthian church had sinned both against Paul and the Corinthian community. Chapter 2, verse 5. This may be the person condemned in 1 Corinthians 5, or perhaps a leader of one of the factions that were against Paul. Either way, now that his sin had been repented of, there was no need for Paul to reiterate it publicly. Repentance leads to forgiveness and restoration. 
And so Paul urged the community now to reaffirm their love for the guilty party. The condemnation the guilty person had received already had been sufficient to result in his repentance, and so now it was time for their restoration. Paul had forgiven him, and he urged the Corinthians to demonstrate their own forgiveness of him, lest he be overwhelmed by sorrow. Chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And expose the temptation to despair and give up. This is Satan's strategy, verse 11, to persuade us in the midst of temptation that we can sin without consequences. But after we've sinned, to argue that there's no way back to God for people like us. The Christian community can aid us in both halves of that struggle. First, by dealing seriously with unconfessed sin in our midst, but then also by warmly restoring sinners who repent. The gospel is, after all, good news for sinners, and we are all sinners by nature. Application questions. 1. Describe a situation where you needed comfort. How did God comfort you in that situation? How did people help to comfort you? 2. How is the gospel comforting news for us? 3. How is Jesus the yes to all of God's promises to us? 4. Have you ever seen a church carry out discipline against a member? How was it done? Was the person ultimately restored to the community?